<laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right, chapter 26, uh, uh, lecture 3 or C. Um, it's going to be a quick lecture today. We're going to talk about the rising tide of conservatism in the 70s into the early 80s. Uh, the weather's got us all feeling good morning. Um, and so we're all happy over here now, for the most part. Now, that being said, uh, we're going to go quickly through this today. Make sure you're tracking everything. I've, I put it out there. Book things next week. All next week, there'll be no lectures. Uh, make sure you're getting that stuff done. I'll probably extend the deadline for the paper. Uh, please, please, you're tracking that and all your reaction quizzes and quizzes. Make sure you're up to date. Um, the, the, next, the next test that will be in this class will be the final, and that's not until the end of April, beginning of May. So you've got over a month-ish out from the test for the final, um, so make sure you're staying on top of things. Grades are looking pretty good right now. I can stay on top of all that stuff, um, but make sure you're staying on that. Okay, the 1970s created a widespread sense of anxiety amongst Americans. Um, I don't think I need to explain that. Um, drug use was pretty heavy. Did I talk about the LSD employee the other day? Yeah, <clears throat> I think so. The, the, so there was, I saw it happened in Missouri. <clears throat> so one of the drugs that came in the 60s, 70s was LSD, right? That really hard drug that came out. Well, there was an employee. Uh, one thing they found about LSD, by the way, was they did studies. It greatly expands the mind and it actually increases your capacity to understand stuff. But it's highly addictive and then it destroys the brain. So like in small quantities, LSD is great, right? That's why it was created. Uh, for all research for scientists because they had a bunch of sci like 12 scientists who couldn't solve problems take it then they you know they solved the problems they were working on and then they all died from addiction so anyway an employee was viewed as the negative Nancy negative person at work uh, a fellow co-worker laced his drinks or food with LSD saying he needed to lighten up um, so uh, I don't know about you <coughs> I don't think LSD is the way to go to lighten someone up. I think there's other alternatives to light people up, not freaking yeah, LSD. Yeah. <laughs> well, that one, yeah. Anyway, economic problems, civil rights, and sexual revolutions produced resentments across the country. Uh, rising urban crime rates. Uh, Neoconservatives, a group of intellectuals who are, are crazy this, that the 60s have produced a decline in moral standards and respect for authority will go on the rise. So basically, the late 60s, early 70s, all this rise, spike in crime, right? Insubordination, the hippie movements, the sexual revelations, all of this, right? There, people are saying this is creating a bad society. Divorce rates skyrocketing. So you're going to see the rise of the religious right. Uh, religious fundamentalist, uh, evangelical, oh, I hate that word, evangelical Protestants flourished. Or the third great awakening sometimes. Yeah. One person you're going to see, like Billy Graham, go on television, his crusades, right? He emerged in the 50s, but preachers on television, you're going to see a religious right start to say, these things are wrong. We need to get back to fundamentals. We need to get back to being going to church. We need to focus on religion again. Although it spoke of restoring traditional values, it proved remarkably adept at using modern technology as well. Television. The televangelist. You ever seen the old people that watch those preachers on television? They're getting up there, whoa, send money to Albuquerque or whatever, right? A lot of them are scams. But the point of it is the religious right's going to organize in the late 70s. Yes? Have you seen that commercial for Miracle Spring Water? Speaking of the preacher scams? No, but it sounds pretty funny. Yeah, big time preacher was like saying, drink this spring water, it'll heal you, make your life better. On a funny note, talking about you know, water. Um, there was a, I think it was in Jerusalem or someplace, there was a Jesus statue. Um, and it started leaking water one day. And so the water had come down, like, it was coming out the toes. So, like, water running on a statue. Oh, a miraculous sign, right? Well, they figured out, oh, not too long after, after people started bottling it and then drinking it, well, it was a leaky toilet. So it was holy water in one way, I guess. Anyway, but the religious right adapts. Um, and they're going to play a big uh, play in the early 80s. We'll get to them a little bit later. But they start to organize and they start to really push uh, a lot of uh, people in the country back towards religion. The Battle of the Equality Equal Rights Amendment. So rising tide of conservatism too. In 1972, with a little opposition, Congress approved the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, caused an uproar though. People basically... <coughs> 
The Equal Rights Amendment was talking about equality across the board in all aspects of everyday life for all sexes and everything. Cause an uproar thanks to the mobilization of conservative women. The amendment failed to achieve ratification by the required 38 states. So basically a group of conservative women said we don't like this, it's too liberal. Going back to that religious right movement, they kill the amendment. Part of the checks and balances with this country is an amendment, though Congress may pass it, has to be ratified by the states. So 38 states did not ratify it. I don't even think it was over 30. Uh, the abortion controversy, Roe versus Wade, was a big court case in the early 70s. The religious right is going to point to this as a problem. Abortion debate caused some violent lines in American politics, and it's still to this day very heavily embedded in this country about abortion. It's all Roe versus Wade did and all it established was you could have an abortion up to, I think, three months. So the first trimester. There's a very short window that you're legally allowed to have abortion. By federal, by by this court case, states can allow you to go. Like New York allows all the way up to full term abortions now, and that causes an uproar. Most states, it's under 20 weeks, or it's 12 to 20 weeks, somewhere in there. Uh, it varies a little bit to the state to states, and there's been challenges. Uh, but pretty much anything after 20 weeks, states can regulate. The tax revolt, economic problems allow conservatives to broaden their appeal, reduce government, reduce government spending. Tax reduction served as dual purpose for enhancing business profits and reducing the resources available to the government, thus making new social programs financially impossible. This is still an issue going on today. This emerges in the 70s uh, about we need to spend less money, we need to reduce taxes. These are things you hear about the news all the time. They become mainstay in the 70s. Uh, conservatism in the West um, is going to grow. Primarily in the South, California will be conservative for a period in the, 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 the 70s and 80s, like Reagan. After Reagan, it will definitely go um, left. Now, they do one thing that does emerge in the, the 70s and 80s, not to be confused with conservatism, but conservationism. Um, you're going to see a big push for resources in the 70s and 80s because the West, much harsher climate. They got droughts more like California. Cal, uh, California, New Mexico, um, down into Arizona. So you're going to see some rise, especially in Arizona, of conservatives because a lot of them move into that Sun Belt warmer climates. The Sunbirds, you know, those people that leave the middle Midwest during the winter. So there is a, a drastic change in parts of those country, uh, the country. The election of 1980. Now, riding this tide of conservatism, the election of 1980 proves to be one of the most uh, important elections um, in recent times, mostly because it changes the whole course direction of the country in the 80s. Um, I, I'm a little biased. I do think um, the election of 1980 ushered in one of the best presidents we've had. I'll be honest on that. Um, there, He's not perfect. No president is perfect. But I do think some of the things that he did were good for the country at the time. Could Reagan exist today? Probably not. Just kind of like could uh, Washington Washington exist today? No. Could Lincoln exist today? No. Uh, could FDR exist today? Possibly. Truman? Probably not. A lot of these presidents are born for their time period, right? Like Trump would have probably flourished in the 80s if you think about it. That being said, Carter's approval rating fell to 21%, one of the lowest ever recorded for a president while in office. Trump's, if you put it in perspective, Trump's has been hovering around between 35 to 45%, give or take, when the poll is taken, right? So Trump is not the most unpopular president ever elected. That's a misnomer. Ronald Reagan's uh, slogan was, let's make America great again. I wonder where uh, Trump got his slogan. Uh, and then the era of self-doubt is over. He, he said, we need to make America great again. Let's make America great again. And then... Uh, we need to get the era of self-doubt is over. So like during Carter's presidency in the 70s, there was this doubt about whether we're actually a good country. Are we, you know, are we really doing anything well? Um, he believes a big advocate of states' rights, meaning states have rights to do stuff, kind of like Nixon preached a little bit and a lot of presidents before him um, had done. Other presidents say, no, the national government needs to come in. Like FDR was all about the government coming in and controlling everything. Republicans intended to be let the states take care of the business. And that's a big draw between the Democrats and Republicans in this day is Republicans tend to say let the states decide issues where Democrats say let the federal government decide issues. There's a, there's, there's a coin to both of that where, yes, it's good for the federal government to come and regulate some things, 
but then there's some things that states should regulate. Finding that happy medium is something we can't agree on right now. <laughs> it's something that's hard uh, to find full acceptance or compromise on. And you can see with our government today that we still haven't found that happy medium. He won over the religious right, though he was the first divorced man to run for president. He divorced his first wife and then married uh, Nancy, um, Nancy Reagan. Um, that should be, obviously, I don't remember her maiden name, but Nancy was his second wife. Uh, so that's significant. He wins the religious right over, though he had been divorced. But he'd been married for her to her since 1951, 52. So he'd married her for a long period, right? He was also a... Uh, um, a former movie star and he had this appeal you ever seen videos of Reagan speak could you listen to him for a long time speak yeah he was an actor right so he knew how to appeal and to present himself I'm not saying he was the most intelligent president I'll never say that but he could sell himself and could articulate things well whether you liked Obama or not and we're not going to get into that debate Obama was a good speaker he was very good at articulating things George W. Bush was not a great speaker, but some would argue his intelligence was higher than it actually was. Clinton, another great speaker, eloquent, charisma. Um, not all presidents, I would argue, Trump's charisma is different. He does have a sense of charisma that he can appeal to people, it's just a different style. In either case, he rode a wave of dis dis dissatisfaction with the country's current situation. He will win the election very, very easily. Now, at first, they weren't for sure he could beat Carter. But in the end, his election was a landslide. Very easily won. Carter barely won anything. This will launch the Reagan Revolution. This is the election of 1980. They were worried that Reagan would lose the election. Uh, they didn't have to worry too much. If you look at this slide on the power deck, Reagan, yeah, he won everything west of the Mississippi except Minnesota and Hawaii. That's a pretty big sweep to win not only California, Texas, and New York, you swept the whole West besides Hawaii. That's crazy. <coughs> Carter carries super liberal strongholds of Minnesota. Georgia's conservative, but why would they vote? Why did Georgia go Carter? Where's he from? Georgia. Rhode Island, Maryland. Jimmy Carter. Uh, is, uh, is ran out of office essentially. He's ran out. Okay, we'll do a couple slides here. We'll call it a day. Uh, the Reagan Revolution. Reagan was originally a New Deal Democrat. He had supported FDR in the 30s and 40s. Uh, we, he was head of the Screen Actors Guild. Became a strong anti-communist though. In the late 40s, once the McCarthyism, all these, you know, the communist Cold War, all that, he switches parties because he doesn't believe the Democrats are being progress or going after communism effectively. He doesn't like their approach. Uh, and then in the 60s, he's going to become governor of California. He ran for president a couple of times. Never, he lost the nomination a, co a couple of times. Uh, by 76, he was a mainstay in the political party of the Republicans, being a former governor of California. He nearly got the nomination in 76 over Ford, which that nomination was held in Kansas City. But finally, 1980, he will win the party's nomination. Uh, Reagan and American freedom. Um, when he left office, he was the oldest man to ever serve as president. He was an excellent speaker. Reagan repeatedly invoked the idea that America divinely appointed a mission as beacon of liberty and freedom. So, as he comes into office, um, and as he leaves office, his eight years, he's elected twice, oldest man to ever serve as president, he had the grandfather appeal. He spoke eloquently, but he talked about America's divine purpose. We're here for a reason. So he talked about self-doubt, right, in the 70s. He gave Americans purpose in the 80s. Now, it wasn't all rosy. The economics weren't always the best, but he talked about we have a purpose. We have a divine right. We're here to do something. Um, he's going to reshape the nation's agenda and political language more effectively than any president since FDR. Some argued that when he ran, um, he was trying to invoke a Cold War that would escalate into actual war. But because of his hard stances against the, commun the communist governments in Eastern Europe, especially the Soviet Union, he put in place a way for the United States to finally come to a complete resolution with the Soviets. We basically buried them through economics. Why? We outspent them. We could spend all the money we want on the military, right? 
We had the resources, we could build a huge, we could rebuild our military. Well, they got bogged down in Afghanistan while the Soviets always wanted to outdo us, right? Could they economically outdo us with the way their economy was shaped? No, because of Reagan and us spending massive monies on our rebuilding our military, we basically bankrupt the Soviets, which is crazy to think about. In 1981, he presented Congress to reduce the, ter the tax rate uh, from 70 to 50 percent. By 86, reduced taxes on the wealthy Americans to 28 percent. His economic program, known as supply side economics or trickle down, was a controversial policy at the time. It's still controversial. Did it really increase uh, or improve the economy? Yes and no. It's one of those things that has benefits, it doesn't have benefits. The rich get richer, but it does spur people to spend more money and it does lead to some rises in jobs. More jobs, more paying jobs, higher paying jobs, right? Less taxes. It does create some shortfalls in government spending. We go into more deficit spending. But the trickle-down effect does have positive effects on the economy by the late 80s and early, to, or early 90s. Think about it, the greatest decade for economics is probably the 90s, right? 50s and 90s, probably the two best ages of capitalism that America's ever seen. Without the trickle-down of the 80s, I don't think that happens. Does that make sense? So the boom of the 80s where the, rich, the big companies got richer, they had a lot of extra cash. Yes, we start taxing more comes by the 90s, but that allows a lot of growth that may or may not have happened. Like I said, you cannot say trickle down was 100% effective. You can't say it's 100% ineffective. It did do its job as far as kickstarting the economy. It does improve in the mid 80s, uh, but we're, that's where I'm going to leave it at for now. Uh, Reagan Revolution 2. This will be the last slide for today. Uh, Reagan and labor inaugurated an era of hostility between the federal government and organized labor. Unions are going to take some hits from Reagan's pre presidency. In August of 81, 113,000 13, members of the PAC or the Union on Air Traffic Controllers, so people that work in air towers, uh, went on strike. He fired them all. He fired all 13,000 rehired new ones. Spurred many private employers to launch anti-union offensives, meaning, hey, the president's going to back, you know, uh, companies over unions, which you can make that say that was the wrong, good course. Uh, he did it, um, and it sent a message. Reaganomics initially produced the most severe recession since the 30s from 81 to 82. So like I said, initially it looked like Reaganomics might be a disaster, right? However, inflation fell from 13 to 3.5% 3, 3 uh, after 80, 1982. The real gross domestic product had risen by 25% and unemployment was down to 5.5% going into 82-83. So initially, 81 to 82, the Democrats are like, aha, trickle down is not going to work, right? Because the economy slowed, jobs were lost, we receded, right? But then started in 82, guess what happens? We grew. We grew. The economy kicked back up into gear. And we were going to launch a massive economic growth over the next several years. Okay, so that's where I say some people say, "Well, look at the recession, right?" However, by 82, 83, 84, the economy has turned around. Does that make sense? The other thing that's going to help Reagan, so is, is he's going to be unpopular in 81, 82. By 83, 84, his popularity soars, but in 81. If his popularity is declining, it's going to skyrocket. Does anyone know why it skyrockets? Not because of the economy. Did he have a movie? Nope. <clears throat> nope. Boom. Assassination attempt. He nearly dies. John Hinckley Jr., remember we talked about it in class your uh, sophomore year? The bullet ricocheted off the limousine. John Hinckley was trying to impress Jodie Foster. Joke was on him because she's gay. Uh, but she wasn't known at the time. She was still on, she didn't come out of the closet until about eight, six years ago, eight, six years ago. <coughs> tried to impress her by killing the president. He failed. Uh, Reagan nearly did die. Um, did wound his press secretary, uh, Beatty, I think was his name. Grady, no, it was Grady was his name. Um, but his popularity will soar after his death because people were worried that he would die and all that. Uh, problem in inequality. Um, Reagan's policies, rise stock price, and de-industrialization resulted in a considerable rise in economic equality. 
By the mid-90s, the richest 1% of Americans own 40% of the nation's wealth. Like I said, that is one of the knocks on it. But you're going to see economic growth occur for all classes in the 80s. Income of middle class families stagnated with that of the poorest uh, declined. So you're going to have some of the middle class grow, but the poor are going to remain poor. The problem is the poor are not going to see a lot of growth. If anything, they're going to decline a little bit. Okay, that's where we're going to stop today. We'll get into Reagan Revolution 3 tomorrow. Um, and have a good day.